Welcome one and all. We are back. It is Garden America. How about that? The weekend is here. Hope you had a good week. I'm Brian Main. My colleagues are here. We've got the A team, the varsity players, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. We're going to be talking and doing something, something a little different today. I think you're going to like it. We're actually going to be talking about gardening, landscaping, horticulture. We have our guest lined up today. Uh, maybe go down a few rabbit holes, Tiger. Uh, but for <laughs> it the would most be part, normal. But for the most part, yes, being sarcastic, it is a garden show. We like to drift sometimes. Uh, we'll see how, how good we can stay on course. Yeah, I think that though, how well we, we, we have a lot course. to talk about today, though, being you know this weather, springtime, lots happening. I just had a wonderful tour of my own garden. I posted some pictures to our Facebook page this morning. Uh, what's blooming? What's uh, coming? Uh, what's ripening? My my orange tree. If, did you see the picture of my orange tree and how many oranges are on it? Yeah, what's up with that? And they're they're tasting good this year. <laughs> they tasting, are tasting good this it's year. It's a tasty yeah. tree, is what it, that is. It is. It is. So um, yeah, there's a lot happening. Any in my surprises? Own yard. I know. I know. Periodically, you'll say, "Well, I walked outside and I I came across this and I never even knew I had it." That daylily that um, is posted in the uh, or pic. There's a picture in the post. Um, was one that John gave me for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. I think I gave you two, right? Yes, you gave me two. The other one is not blooming yet, but that one is blooming. But it's a really unique, multicolored, multi-petaled daylily. And so I thought that was that was fun. I'd ne- I had not seen it yet until now. The bloom, I would say. The plant was there. By the way, <laughs> Carolyn uh, Bryan says that uh, whatever you have to say will be appreciated. You know, th- that's why we love our listeners and viewers so much because – They put up with us. They do. And, and what's interesting, when we do deviate from gardening, they're quick to jump in with their thoughts, answers, questions, comments, yeah. whatever direction you want to take the show, uh, we'll, we'll try to stay on course. Well, as long as you did that and went off course. <laughs> Here we go. John's Uh-oh. rabbit hole, Already, ladies and gentlemen. We're what, one minute into the show? Shannon and I watched a movie last night that maybe you guys have seen, and it – it seemed like it took a long time to develop. You're waiting for like the plot to begin? Well, it began, but it just it took forever, but it was really enjoyable. 101 Dalmatians? No. Oh. No. It was um trying to think now. It was it originally came out in Polish with subtitles. I don't think I've ever seen this movie, but go ahead. And it was called Forgotten Love. Oh, no. Sounds and, like a romance novel. And yeah. it, it was oh, yeah. it was a nice movie because uh, you know it had a great ending and and uh, as you go through it, it I I just liked it. I'd recommend it to to anyone who wants to just see a good movie. Now you Forgotten said it was a, love. Forgotten love. You Forgotten used the word nice. I I've never heard anybody describe a movie as well, it was nice. Really, it's a nice movie. Great movie. Well, because movies today aren't nice anymore. No, they're not. That's true. Now, how old is this movie? Is it older? Is it new? No, it's a new movie. Okay. Subtitles. Well, this one was uh, on Netflix. You can go to Netflix if you've got Netflix. Mm -hmm. And it came out in English. And it's basically about a surgeon who – a surgeon who gets attacked and loses his memory. Oh, okay. Well, you can identify with that, huh? (laughs) <laughs> but but you weren't you weren't necessarily attacked, <laughs> and no, you're not a surgeon. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> anyway, um, oh. that is off topic. But you know, it's so hard to find movies that you you don't cringe when you watch anymore. I think that's good though. Every now and then during our show, we give a little movie tip or, or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, Forbidden Love. Forgotten. Forgotten. I like Forbidden Love. Yeah, that's that's forbidden diff- Love. That's I a have different a, movie. I have my and, uh, yeah. You might probably that, need that's a another disclaimer. rabbit hole we yeah we do there, not dare venture. Th- there was um, trying to think. <laughs> it was called Forgotten Dreams. There's a rose called Forgotten Dreams. Oh, and every year they uh, they do an analysis of of roses that came out the previous year. Sure. To tell you whether or not you should have them, and you would be able to read in these comments what people had saying. And one person wrote, "Best forgotten." <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it comes out every year because the people forget it, and they're like, "Oh, forgotten dream again." Wait a minute, I forgot about this. One. My filter is working right now. <laughs> We've that's, got that's um, good. <laughs> it is because I want to say things like, "Nah, you don't need to say that." Not not bad things, <laughs> but would just take us way off course. 
Uh, Unlike what I just did. Yeah. The you know, pe- People can identify with movies, John. That was good. Yeah, it's still a little bit off course. Yeah. But anyway, the uh, Rose Auction is next weekend. How exciting. And uh, people were – I've gotten a few emails – from people who saw the podcast I did with Teresa Byington. Very nice. good. And it is out. Did you hear it? You no, no, it? but I'm yeah. glad people found it. Oh. You weren't sure how you were going to hook up with her when we talked about it a few weeks ago. Yes, it, end, it ended up coming out okay. So it's uh, if you Google Rose Chat Podcast, mm-hmm. so three words, Rose Chat Podcast, uh, Teresa Byington is – the host and and I'm on there for the the whole show. And how and long was the show? The podcast? It's like forty five minutes or something. And like you that. still had a lot to say, right? That you. Oh yeah. At the end, in. I said, you know, I can go another hour if you want. Yeah, that's beautiful. But Good. but if you want to find out a little bit more about me, it's just like this show. I kind of go off off on a tangent sometimes. But it tells about the, talks about the auction, talks about where I went to school, talks about growing up, a lot of stuff. Um. It's interesting. In- yeah, Regarding the auction, people can go online and bid this year again, right? Except if okay. you're listening to this on the radio. Because it's already happened. Because this is the day of the right, auction. Right, you're too late. Yeah, well, and it's too late. Yeah, but we'll make sure to post something online. We'll, we'll post a link to it. Which is one more reason that if, yeah. if we have listeners on BizTalk Radio, we love our BizTalk listeners, you can yeah. watch us live on Facebook Every week, go to a Garden America radio show on Facebook, 8 o'clock on the West Coast, 11 o'clock Eastern Time Zone. You can join this wacky crew that we have, this lovable crew that we have on Facebook. We love each and every one of you. So that's one way to keep up with us uh, every weekend. Otherwise, you're listening to last week's show. We did get some bids from Hawaii. Ooh. And, uh, I'm concerned we, about transportation well, we, delivering to— uh, We can't ship soil to Hawaii. Yeah. Thus lies the rub? Well, this person— that bid on a bunch of roses said he could pick them up in San Jose. Are you listening, Tanya? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if someone like Tanya wanted uh, this guy to come to her place and pick up roses, I could ship them to to anywhere in San Jose. I don't San think Jose. she minds strangers knocking on her door. <laughs> we don't really know a lot about our the private lives of our listeners. Yeah. So No, we don't. Anyway, uh, I'm I'm just kidding, but um, uh, we'll we'll work out a way to get him his roses. But anywhere in the contiguous, as you like to say, Brian, the 48 contiguous. Yeah, we can go ahead and ship roses after May 6 because this year we've got Costa Rica coming up, and yeah, quickly uh, too. We're, and we're going to be busy. I know it's just so fast. We're going to try to do a show on the 27th. You say from Costa Rica, Tiger, that Saturday? Yeah. Okay, Correct. we're going to do our best. Yeah. We should and, have and no we'll problems. No, I don't think we'll have any problems. And we'll also be posting some videos and pictures oh, throughout the whole trip. So right. people will be following us throughout our, our fun trip that we'll be doing. doing. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna hang on to me upside down by my ankles during the river trip with, yes. the, with the Caymans and the alligators? And yes. All that? Yes. Just don't and draw then, me. And then we're going to go down together on the zip line. Oh, I'm all, I'm all about that. Yeah. Hey, it goes there faster was, that way. There was a there was actually somebody posted a video on YouTube. This this uh, father and son were in Costa Rica, going down the zip line. Now apparently on this zip line you can actually break if you want to. You don't have oh, to just like like stop. So the kid's going down and the kid's oh he starts to yell and he puts the brake on. There was a sloth on the zip on line? the cable. What just hanging there? That's cool. And it's like okay we gotta. So I guess what he did he kind of picked him up a little bit the sloth. Grabs onto him. Grabs onto him, and he continued the zip line. Hey. <laughs> I just thought, you know. And <laughs> luckily, funny. he saw him in plenty of time. Oh, yeah. Because uh, there that was a sloth on a Costa Rica zip line. <laughs> All right, John, your quote of the week. We've got about a minute to go until the first break. We'll bring on our guest. I don't need a qu- uh, minute for the quote because it's a I, short one. This is one that you like. Yeah, you like short, short quotes. And to the point. That's right. This one, Brian, it says, look deep into nature. And then you will understand everything better. Absolutely. And that was by Albert Einstein. Al? <laughs> I've got an Albert Einstein story uh, from when he was giving lectures, uh-huh. you know, different universities, so on and so forth. So one time he was scheduled to give a talk, and he was sick. He couldn't make it. He told his chauffeur, you're going to have to tell him I'm sick. I can't make it. And he says, 
why? I could, I could give the same lecture. I've watched you over 300 times. I know exactly what you're going to say. He says, okay, I, I go ahead. So he kind of dressed up as Einstein, you know, put the mustache on. And <laughs> Einstein was actually in the audience. He just was in Wasn't no condition to, to talk. talk. He gave a perfect lecture. And then somebody asked him a question that he didn't know. And he said, sir, that question is so obvious that even my chauffeur could answer that question. And Einstein got up in the back, had a cap on, answered the question flawlessly. <laughs> I don't know if after 300 lectures I could repeat Einstein. Yeah. But I guess if you hear it over and over again. Is that true? Yeah, true story. Really? True story. Look it up. As, as they say, right? <laughs> you can look it up. Google, Google it. Google me. We're hey, going to take a break. Okay. Colleen's right. looking forward to Tomato Mania today. Ooh. Up in it. Santa Running Inez. Running late, but sounding nice. great. Back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio, this is Garden America. We have returned from the break. Uh, Biz Talk Radio, thank you for tuning in. The rest of us on Facebook Live this morning. Happy weekend to you. I'm Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Pella Fox. This is our little quaint, humble garden show. We call it Garden America. To you, Tiger, we're going to bring on our guest and speak with Jurg this morning on Garden America. Yeah, this morning our guest is Jurg Spori with uh, AgroWin uh, Fertilizers. And AgroWin is a creator of wonderful organic fertilizers, worm castings, rock dust, um, all kinds of great, healthy products, minerals for your soil. Uh, Jörg, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, you guys. Glad to be back on the show. Thank you much. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah, you've been on our show before, kind of know how things work. Uh, Jörg, tell us a little bit about AgroWin and, and how it came about and what you guys do. Okay. Well, we have five products, and two soil amendments, that means three fertilizers. Uh, we distribute the rock dust, agrowin minerals. We distribute the agrowin pure organic worm castings. And then I manufacture the three fertilizers, rose, flower, citrus, avocado fertilizer, that's the 446. Then the acid lover plant food, that's a very powerful one, which is a 637. Does not contain the rock dust and the worm castings for the reason of uh, it will be different in the bag and I don't get as high numbers. Oh. As the soil amendments have lower NPKs, therefore, if you want higher ones, you hold that off. And so people can amend that with rock dust or worm casting or both. And, but it's still a complete fertilizer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's the acid lover plant food it's for the camellia, azalea, hydrangeas any tropicals and it's very good for our soils huh? yeah which is usually clay, DGs and uh, you know uh, it likes the fungal activities so this is the fungal <clears throat> most dominant product I have Okay. and then we have the palm and lawn food 3 to 4 NPK, and that has the most possible worm castings within a blend of fertilizers, of natural fertilizers. So and the acid lover and the palm food, they're 100% natural. And then 
the rose and flowers, citrus, avocado, vegetable formula, the 446, and CK is certified organic. And the rock dust and the worm castings as well is certified organic CDFAs. And did you get that started? Means California Department of Agriculture. <laughs> yeah. and, and did you get started creating these products for the home gardener, or was this more farmer based uh, when, you, uh, when you were? These are formulas for everyone. But but no, when you first started creating these products, were these for more like farm yes, growers? For, for for nurseries, the target was nursery landscape and mm. homeowners. Yes, okay. absolutely. And. I, and, I naturally have, you always have a bigger picture, but the farmers are very difficult to get into and, with the solid kind of granular, for, okay. although not granular, but with the solid materials, the blends with cotton, soya, salsa, you know, uh, cone, bone meal, feather meal, sulfate of potash, they're all different sizes of particles. So there's no like a chemical which has a... 100% homogenized or, you know, all balanced in one little pellet. Mm. That doesn't work with natural products. Yeah, definitely. You got to kind of use it as a whole. And, you know, these products, you know, being the organic fertilizers, the rock dust, the worm castings, you know, is this the time of year that you want to start using these products in the soil uh, for your home garden yeah. and for your lawn? Uh, your... That's a good question. Uh, I always say in organics, it not necessarily matter when you're applying it. It's a matter that you're giving it to the soil because the natural products are not water-soluble, so they don't disperse and leach the nitrates and sulfates into the water, and not, not all the product will stay where you put it because it dissolves in water. So you have water runoff, you have leaching and all that you need to do. So at that point, the organic and naturals are applied at any time of the season. You can naturally time it depending on your budget. You can, depending on the weather, <coughs> you can work with all that. Yes. <laughs> Some people use the moon phases, so they're planting the deep rooters in the waning phase, right? Yeah. And the growing up, the one like flowers grow up above soil, uh, soil ground. At that point, you're using this on the rising moon. Yeah, John. John here is a huge <laughs> almanac and moon planter for yes, sure. Yes, he is. You know, he's following all of the stars and everything. Um, it's so funny. Ah. It's funny that you mentioned that too, because I saw this funny meme with the with the uh, eclipse coming that it showed yeah. like the different moon and sun locations, and it's like this is a solar yeah. eclipse, this is a lunar eclipse, but it was um, it was there was the 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 Earth. And then the sun, and then the moon, and it said, "This is an apocalypse." <laughs> so if it ever lines up like yeah. that, so yeah, yes, um, it has two lips on it, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we might want to clip that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Hey, so, so regard actually, you mentioned something very good. If we, if, we, if I may, may mention, mm -hmm. the rock dust is also paramagnetic. The opposite of paramagnetic is diamagnetic. So it's polarizing very well with the plants. Also, the rock dust has very uh, well-balanced micronutrients and macronutrients, where the macro would be a calcium-magnesium, and that ratio is nearly like a human supplement should be, a one-to-one. -one. Mm. Uh, and there's no other rock dust out there who has low heavy metals and a balance on that calcium-magnesium ratio. So, so, you know, to dive into the rock dust a little bit more, um, yeah. you know, that's, you, you know, you're basically, you're, you're feeding the soil, you're feeding the, the area around that plant. Um, so that way yes. the plant can now absorb more and, and, and kind of well, take up more. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I would say feeding the plant, you're actually feeding the microbiology by mm. creating it. Okay. The rock dust is an inorganic compound. is very hard. So a worm will digest it. You know, an anthropod may go through it. Uh, but it's a bacterializer of the soils. And that supplies also then the macro-micronutrients to break down by those little critters. Mm -hmm. So... It will inc it's actually a bloom of bacterium because 
the particle size is 0 0.06 millimeter, the largest one, so it's a very fine powder. You can think of how dusting the area like powder sugar over a cake or like a flour, yeah? Yeah. And so it's a rock flour in that manner, and it has every conceivable macro micronutrient in it. <clears throat> Plus, I mentioned the paramagnetism magnetism as well. So yeah. the, it will eliminate the transplant shock. So you dust out a planting hole, for instance, then you can mix up with the backfill as well, and then you can give it at any time thereafter. Okay. Hey, hey, Jörg, we're going to take a break. When we get back from the break, we're going to continue ta chatting with Jörg with AgroWind Fertilizers. And, and Jörg, we want to know, like, like you're saying, how do you apply these products to these plants down the road? So Absolutely. Questions, comments on Facebook. You know what, uh, what to do, where to do it, comment section. This is Garden America. Going to take a break for our good friends on BizTalk Radio. Back with Jörg after these messages. This is Garden America. Those of you tuned in, welcome back to uh, the show. Welcome back to Garden America Biz Talk Radio Facebook Live. And we're getting some education here this morning. Jörg is our guest, Tiger, as uh, we continue with our conversation. Yeah, we were just chatting with Jörg about the products that they sell at AgroWind Fertilizers. And and John here has a bag. He's doing uh, exercises with the rock dust that Jörg sells. And before the break, Jörg, you were describing how to use the rock dust as a an ability to prevent transplant shock by um, kind of lining the uh, hole that you dig with this powder to, um, you know, make sure that the root system goes goes into it and distributes its, uh, you know, minerals and things throughout the whole thing. Now, if somebody was to want to use this rock dust uh, on an existing bed, how would you recommend they put it on? Yes. It's a very and fine powder, the by the way. Hole, that's a very good thing. And in the backfill, dust out the hole. And there is also a notion when you really have a good success with is when people come to the nurse and say, hey, my flowers are dropping, my fruits are dropping. That means you are calcium magnesium deficient or micro macronutrients deficiency, and that will take care of that. So it will hold more. Mm -hmm. And also in the cannabis industry, they will be growing more plant sugar, basically. And that's very desirable to hold those flowers. Okay. Yeah. And but but I mean if you have an existing landscape, it's a very fine oh. powder. Do you just try to distribute it over the soil and then water it in? Correct. Okay. Both ways work, <clears throat> actually. The easy way I put it in if it's a small area, you have a small salt shaker or a plastic shaker mm. and then you just sprinkle out around the plants. <laughs> don't don't put that back in your kitchen. When, when, uh, when you're done. No, well, actually, <laughs> I drink some of that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You're, it's uh, uh, a very intriguing product, which <laughs> has also holistic aspects, which I never mentioned. So you okay. have to be careful with that. So, Definitely. You know. <laughs> Do your and, research. But I had acid, acid reflux, and I drink alkaline water from Carlsbad and uh, a little breeze of rock dust that it said aloud, and then but floats is colloidal minerals in pure form. Yeah. They, you don't get that that easy. With not that many heavy metals, you know. Right. Whereas I used to drink diatomaceous earth, so then I looked at the analysis and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I have the better product. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> at and, least for the health part, you know, <laughs> DE is good for something else. <laughs> and in and, and worm castings, you know, a lot yeah. of people are familiar with that and how, you know, what they're supposed to do with it. But yeah. how do you recommend applying worm castings to an existing garden, too? Is that, again, because they kind of come in soil form and kind of can clump up. Do you kind of drop it down like a, you know, fertilizer? You know, do you only recommend planting okay. with it? <clears throat> okay, understood. Uh, worm casting applications, we... I would just also like to point out what's the difference between the worm casting and wormy compost. Mm -hmm. So most other people, 
I don't want to mention any major names, but these are mainly made with a com wormy composting process that means worms and their compost to disintegrate. So there will be not pure castings. How to find the difference between a wormy composting bag and <clears throat> pure castings? Both will say pure castings because the act department lets them get away with that. So they, when, when you have compost and the worms eat the compost, that means the, what they poop, when they poop, that's pure casting. So mm. within the compost is X amount of castings, and we have 99% pure casting. Oh, wow. So therefore, the application rates will really help you to understand what is what. A 10-pound bag of agrowin pure organic worm casting covers 100 square feet. On a golf course, we can go as an, a ton per acre. So you can't spread any of these wormy composts because they don't have, they have too much undigested carbon in there. Yeah. So at that point, to apply the casting is like heavy pepper seasoning over the soil. Mm. Now, if you have a little time to crawl it or you move the topsoil so the, the worm castings, droppings really bond with the soil surface, it will then hold an insane amount of water. That water, again, releases what's in the worm casting, which uh, it's a bag of microbiology, basically. Yeah. And that helps the soil to break down and hold and retain moisture. Naturally, we got enough rain for it right now, but it will really, really be perfect during the summertime to apply worm casting. So the warmer it gets, the more you irrigate, the more castings you want to put into your soil. Therefore, you need less water. It holds over 200% moisture, which is insane. Now, now let me ask you this real quick, too, uh -huh. because, you know, is this something, so say somebody was preparing an area to plant, mm, yeah. whether it be vegetables or anything, perennials. Yeah. Now, you know, some people will come out and they'll come out and amend their soil and do that. And then immediately, do you want to be planting in this and watering it? Because it's almost like you're adding like a live culture to this area, where if you leave it unwatered or unplanted, does do the benefits of the worm castings begin to go away because of exposure uh, to air okay, and sunlight? I, know, I think I know there's a back question of, okay, if the castings, you can let them dry up. They have a natural moisture content as we go because we want to keep the moisture up so the microbiology is alive. Mm -hmm. So if you top dress it, and the sun hits it, it will dehydrate. The right. minute you hit irrigation on it, they will repopulate immediately. Okay. From the soil as well. So, so it will not losing its effect. So if you do have a, I, yeah, a dry stored, bag, it's not I bad. I stored castings in a pipe sleeve bag to drop in a in a in a spray in a spray tank. Mm -hmm. So I forgot they were there. About two years later, I saw, oh, wow, now I know where they are in that little crate there. <laughs> and so I tossed it on the lawn, and voila, it was perfect coming up green as well. So okay. they don't lose its power. It doesn't really matter what form they are. But naturally, keeping a moist and closed bag, that will be beneficial and out of the sunshine. You don't want to bake those bags if possible. Yeah. yeah, and hey, another thing I would mention so, for people out there that are looking for worm castings, you know, John... Picked up this bag of rock dust, which you know is is actually very heavy compared to what it looks like. Yeah, it's and five pounds. <laughs> I was surprised. It's a little Ziploc bag, for yeah. five, and it's five pounds. Yeah, work but, out um, those triceps, will you? But um, also castings. I mean, when you pick up a bag of pure castings, it's it's dense. Yeah. it's heavy. When you pick up a bag of compost castings, it, you know it's lighter. When you look at the bag, it's bigger, but it's much lighter in weight and. You know, for some reason, yeah, those castings are just so dense and so heavy um, that you could really feel like, you know, yeah, there's there's good stuff in there. John, do you want to back up a little bit with a couple of questions before we move on? Or? Well, yeah, we do have a few questions. Uh, Carla in Huntington Beach uh, urine wants to know if she can find your products in Orange County anywhere. Yes, Orange County Farm Supply. Okay. And... There is also uh, Rogers Garden. Okay, very good. Yeah. And uh, all the site ones could order for you. 
Site ones are Site a one landscape, landscape supply, supply store. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And may I mention easy to find locations for stores would be fertilizeronline.com. Mm. That's my website, and there's a store locator, a store okay. finder. Perfect. Uh, Lenore in Canyon Country wants to know if you can uh, mail order your product from anyone. Fertilizeronline.com. Oh, you sell direct there? That will be direct, yes. Okay, there you go, Lenore, fertilizeronline.com. And then uh, another question from Carla says that she has a has worm bins at home. And she wants to know if there's anything she needs to do to the castings to make them more beneficial or pure. Not really. You could just, it really depends what you feed your worms. Mm -hmm. So it's like garbage in, garbage out. That's what we're all about. (laughs) Works for humans too. So depending on what your worm feed is, that's the quality of castings you will get within your wormy compost bin. And then... I happened to be in the farmer's market 20 years ago, and uh, I got the customer there, which is the second largest certified organic farmer, Chea Rodriguez, that one I mentioned, because we do this for 20 years with him. The rock does some worm casting in the 446. And uh, so that means you just, you know, Lost my trail. Hey, 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 since you lost your trail, Jurg, we're going to have to take a break yeah. here. Sorry, good good point. When we get back, we'll wrap up chatting with Jurg with AgroWind Fertilizers and, um, you know, learn a little bit more about how to get his product and, you know, how to use his product. Absolutely. Do stay with us, those on BizTalk Radio. Those just joining us on Facebook Live, see some familiar names that are checking in this morning. We're going to take a break. Uh, one more segment for those on BizTalk Radio. We'll get back and wrap things up with Jurg, so do stay with us. And, of course, other questions coming in, we'll do what we can to answer those as well. This is Garden America, Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. Welcome to the show. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. We have returned. BizTalk Radio, Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us as we continue with Jurg and uh, wrapping things up, Tiger, with uh, the various products and any last-minute details we may need to hear. Yeah, so as Jurg had mentioned, FertilizerOnline.com is the online source and online uh, source for his product and information, and he does have a store finder because um, I'm sure, you know, it's it's wonderful if you cannot get this product um, near you to give it, get it shipped. But I'm sure that shipping a five pound bag of this rock dust is, is not cheap that it might be able to, yeah, right. it might be a little easier to find it to you at a retailer near you. Um, you're, you, I'm sure you're getting ready for the busy time of year right now. Spring is, is happening here in Southern California. Lots of people are starting to work in their gardens, fertilize, amend their soils. Um, you know, so, you know, again, Thank you for joining us this morning, giving us all the information about your products and, and how to use them. Um, you know, good luck on this spring. I'm, is is Are you already shipping a lot of product right now, or is it starting to turn around right now for you? It's nearly all year round a little bit yeah. because we also use the stuff for indoors, the rock dust, no smell, the worm castings, no smell. So it goes on in the season. It's the same like nurseries. The spring and the fall is naturally the strongest season. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jörg. Have a great rest of the weekend, and um, we'll chat with you again soon. Thank you, Jörg. Any time of the year. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. And there he goes, Jörg. Last name Spory? Say what? Spory. Spory. Yeah. Jörg Spory. We have a... Uh, question from lila tiger she wants to know where you can get those products in san diego Uh oh well lila at mission hills nursery (laughs) really yeah i've got three products i got three products here in studio and all three of those products came from the nursery to be able to kind of show them off um so yeah right there in mission hills and you are i don't want to say centrally located in san diego but you're up from the airport you're you're very close to most everybody you know i mean north and south I definitely feel we're central, right? Yes, yes. It's just the whole east and west thing. It's the east and west thing, thing. yeah. You know, because being along the coast, you know, we're the farthest west. (laughs) Can't, there's not, you know, not much farther we can go 
You know, speaking of directions, <laughs> here we go off the topic quickly, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> quickly. So those those that have Alexa will get various updates, right? Okay. Um, whatever that might be. So we get like, hey, it's going to rain tomorrow or rain today. And you know what we get in, in Scripps Ranch? We get high surf advisories. Oh, I know. There's a high surf advisory for Scripps Ranch. What are we, 10 miles from the beach, 15 oh. miles? And there's a lot of elevation change between so you and I, the I'm, beach. I'm not sure geographically they know exactly where Scripps Ranch is, but <laughs> she had to throw that in speaking of directions to Mission Hills Nursery. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because that's so very true in a, in a, in a modern era as we live in mm-hmm. now that you would think that they would be able to have more distinct information. And just to think that how ahead of the time the Sunset Western Garden book was in the terms of zones. Because before right, right. before the Sunset Western Garden book, it was just USDA zones. Right. And USDA zones covered the whole United States as just a general rule. If right. you lived in this area, yep. you were this zone. But as we know, in California... You could be close to the beach, but you are nothing like the climate of the beach. That's and you could exactly only be right. two or three miles away, but you can have a complete elevation change. You can have, um, you know, a a you know increase or decrease in hot weather or cold weather. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, and it's not far. So that's where the sunset came in and said, "Hey, we're going to break you guys up a little bit more. Sure, to different get more, zones to what? get more distinct." Right. Growing areas for southern was it was it just Southern California, John? What sunset? That? The western was just Southern California. Oh no no no! It was it was all California. Was it all California? Yeah. And then did it go into Arizona and that stuff as well? I, I don't know if that was later or not. It did go up the coast okay. and into Washington and okay. Oregon also. I do know John. But twenty four uh, zones as opposed to eleven. <laughs> For the whole country. For the whole country. John, right. one of our avid viewers and listeners, Ryan, wants to know what your favorite gopher trap is. John, how do you get rid of gophers? You know what? It, it's a we good need... question because, as you know, I just planted uh, a new rose bed. And the roses are all doing really well. And I noticed probably five days ago a uh, gopher in the area. Ah. And going right up to the rose bushes. And so I made it a priority. And I've been using the gopher hawks. And I it took me five days, but I finally got that gopher. And that's number 31. So 31 gophers in the last few weeks. And only one rose, right? Because you were at three, but you said two came back? Two came back. Yeah. Actually, one came back. It's one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's coming back. It's trying to. Okay. I mean, there was really nothing left. If of you that wanted rose. to build a That's barrier, amazing. If you wanted to build a barrier, say around oh, that that a rose moat? garden, how how far down would you have to dig before you would put the uh, the barrier in ground? In other words, how far down would a gopher have to dig to get under? What would be a safe? Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think uh, because. That was something you had to do if you were going to plant coffee on your property. Right. And and uh, my old partner, Tim, ended up uh, planting coffee in Bonzel, and mm. he put the gopher barrier up. And I think that he had to go down. <clears throat> I think it was a trench that was, was it two feet? Yeah, I was going to say at least two feet. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say right. thirty six inches. Yeah, it could have, it could have been two to three feet, and then yeah. then you had to backfill it with rock. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So, and then um, I'm trying to think. You have to. Uh, I'm trying. Was it chicken wire or something they came up with? I don't know. It seems to me like any place I've seen them try that ends up getting gophers anyway. Oh, I mean, they figure I, out a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that product. You know that that fence. Is just like any other fence. All it takes is a, a little chink in it, or right. you know, sure. an opening, and they'll find it. And then now they're in there, and maybe even worse. I guess. I guess if you you caught a gopher in your fenced area, it would be easier because they can't really get out as quickly. But and you would catch it and kill it. But still, that's they climb over the fences too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Did you see that a little gopher? <laughs> his little hands <laughs> climbing up the fence. Going blind. Yeah. Blind the nice blind. thing about the gopher hawks, too, is that they're just dead immediately. Yeah. Yeah. But you do have to be patient with them because 
if you don't catch the gopher the first day, it it almost pays to just move the trap. I was going to ask you that because you said it took you five days to catch it. Yeah. But how many times did you move that trap before you caught it? I think I've probably got six holes up there. Okay. Yeah, we I had, take a ended up using two traps. We've got news coming up for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. We're going to come back at uh, six minutes after. We truly hope you can catch the second hour. One hour, both hours. We do appreciate it. So with that in mind, we're coming back quickly with our friends on Facebook. So questions, comments, uh, whatever direction you want to go this morning here. Brian Maine, John Begnasker, Tiger Palafox. It is Garden America. Well, yes, indeed. We trust you had a good break. Uh, Garden America, we are back. This is our number two for those keeping track on Biz Talk Radio. Facebook Live, it's just one continuous show. And we appreciate you tuning in. We love each and every one of you. Thank you. Biz Talk Radio, again, we are broadcasting live every weekend here from the gorgeous studios in San Diego, iHeart Media and Entertainment. Those on Biz Talk Radio, check in. Facebook page, Garden America Radio Show, 8 o'clock uh, West Coast, Eastern Time Zone, 11 o'clock. To watch live and interact. John, you love to interact, not just with gophers, but the people who follow this show. Yeah, Paula says, I think she's referring to the the uh, gopher hawk. She says they're hard to set in packed soil. <clears throat> it could be, but even in packed soil, because I have some areas that are really, really hard, and it's hard, yeah, hard to you even, do have some. Yeah, it's hard to even get the probe in there. And... Uh, but if you find the hole, the in those soils, the gophers aren't deep. They're up near the top. So a lot of that is just finding the, the hole, the tunnel itself. Wasn't there a trap you talked about years ago that was set up so whichever way the gopher was going? Oh, that was them? the Maccabee gopher Maccabee. trap. And you've got to use two okay. and tie them together with a, a little string. So, I, I was so desperate to get the one up by the rose bed that... I actually dug down and exposed that tunnel and put in a, a Maccabee trap. But so I had the Maccabee trap and I had the Gopher Hawk. And uh, yesterday, last evening, I found out the Gopher Hawk had gotten it. But this nice is a thing never... about the Gopher Hawk too is that it pops up and has little notification, a little yeah. note that you, like like when you, you did deliver your mail, the flag goes up. Yeah, you got one. So, yeah. but this is never ending with you. It's never going to stop, right? Well, that's what John yeah, hopes it's, it's... it will stop if he does it enough. It will, yeah. but... Be- because you're going to decrease the population or the word gets out. Both. <laughs> well, 23 gophers, if they were still there yeah. breeding... <clears throat> it's it's like pulling weeds, right? Yeah. You, you don't pull the weed just because you want that weed to go away. You pull the weed because that weed could potentially turn into 500 more weeds. Yeah, if you right. let it go to seed. Yeah, if you let it go to seed. So it's kind of like that with the gophers. It's like if you start pulling all these gophers out, then like John's saying, now your your whole reproduction cycle gets disrupted. And after hopefully you know a few months or a year, now in the area there's mm-hmm. a lot less population. And then things like natural predators like owls or coyotes or bobcats or whatever it may be that hunt those can actually keep up with the – population in your area you have coyotes john out there oh yeah we've got coyotes and you, and you hear them too don't you at night we've got you know really they haven't been noisy lately but normally you do hear them and what else do you have got bobcats yeah i've got a rattlesnake oh yeah the snakes are probably really yeah, good well snakes i would imagine yeah. yeah yeah in fact the last time i was out there this was a couple two or three years ago 
one cross the road when we were we were walking down toward your where you had your bees, mm-hmm. where you had your hive. Mm. Why did the snake cross the road? To get the gopher. <laughs> to get the gopher. <laughs> hey, yeah. you know, um, I know this quote doesn't quite work for this situation. Oh, we'll make it work. Go but ahead. It's kind of like the reverse where it's like one man's trash is another man's treasure. Mm-hmm. There was just this recent article from Massachusetts about them banning two trees in Massachusetts because they're becoming invasive. And it's funny because I look at these two trees and they just seem like very common trees to me and not that big a deal. One was a Japanese black pine, right? Japanese black pine right. and then the Bradford pear. Yeah. And to us, like we plant those trees here and if you can get a Japanese black pine to grow, you're excited because we don't have a lot of pine trees. And, and you know, their, got, re- their reasoning was? Well, they're super invasive to Massachusetts. And- I think their biggest argument for them doing damage is that they shade areas so much that it doesn't allow for native species to grow under them. And also then that also hurts the um, animal population because there's it's it's what they call like a food desert for these native species of animals because Bradford pear and black pines don't provide any food or shelter for them. And so, um, but I just, I just always find that interesting when it's a very common plant, but then you find out somewhere else it's, it's very invasive. And how many people are asking the question, you know, I want something that's going to provide lots of shade. I want so <laughs> well, you know, well, you know where the problem came. It's the reason why those trees probably became such a problem. It was the people saying, I want something fast growing. Yeah, providing I want good something shade, right? shade. Keep it cool. I want it to flower, or I want it to be evergreen. And yeah, no, that's good. that's a good analogy. Yeah. Well, I was reading an article on invasive species, mm-hmm. and if a human being brings something into the country, uh, if we're talking about plants specifically, uh, and plants it, it, and then it escapes the garden. It, it's invasive, right? Right. But if a bird brings the same seed over, mm-hmm. it's not invasive. Yeah, true. I mean, so I mean, what's the difference? Why? I'm because not, you can't control I'm not the sure instincts all, of a bird? I'm not sure all invasive uh, species are bad. Well, but if you think about it, but isn't it more okay. for disease and things like that, though? Well, no, but but no, but here's the here's the argument on that. Okay, the Japanese black pine and the right. Bradford pear, right. they're native to China and parts of Asia. So to think that a bird could have flown one of those trees here to Massachusetts is very unlikely. What about the uh, the the Sino American whippoorwill. Well, you <laughs> but think about how many stops it would have made from its that that seed would have been lost before it even came close to us. Right? Like it's like it just doesn't hop on a flight from Asia and come all the way across the ocean and then poop a seed out here. It would have That's pooped. twice the word poop has been used on our show this morning. You have <laughs> one true. more. One, we have one, one more, and then we're cut. One more, and then we're done. You know what's interesting? We're watching reruns of Australian Border Patrol, you know, at the airport, <laughs> cus- customs. No, this is customs agents at, at the airport. Okay, okay. And, 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 they, and what are they? The, the biggest things that they're so concerned with is bringing in just what you're talking about, yeah. different foods from other country, uh, uh, plants, so on and so forth, because yeah. they can breed, you know, disease and bugs and things like that. And Australia is very protective of anything that's invasive to their country. And these people, they open their suitcases up and they have all this food. It's like, whoa, first of all, you didn't declare any of this. Yeah. This can't come into the country. This is okay. This, no. And they, they explain why. And it's just amazing how many people, that's how things get across sometimes. Yeah. So you you have to be so vigilant. Yeah, and I mean, I and I see where John's saying, like for instance, like maybe there's something that comes from the the Midwest and it comes over here to the you know West Coast, and you know that's that's a different thing because like you're saying, a bird or an animal could possibly carry that into us and spread it. But if that plant mm-hmm. did not originate in the Midwest to begin with, right, that's a whole nother story. And I, and that's where. I think we're at with some of these plants because, like I said, the Japanese black pine and the Bradford pear are not native to the United States at all. Sure. 
So yeah, there are areas that they grow fine. They're controlled and they're not bad plants, but then, you know, there are other areas of the United States where they actually are very dangerous. Now, now this being an arid desert here. There's no bad plants. There's only bad gardeners. Yes, true. What, what (laughs) should have been maintained better? Are there any trees here that are, that are native to this California, this part of the country, because we're, we're basically an arid desert. Yeah. And oh, a lot yeah, of the, yeah. A lot of the trees, most of the trees were brought here to Southern California. Oh, I mean, for San Diego, so native what do we trees. Have that was native? What? Oak, Torrey Pine, Sycamore, pretty much are the basic three. Are sycamores native? I think so. I could be wrong. California no, Torrey Pines, sycamore, I think. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. The, right. You know, Torrey Pine is like the only pine I tree. think you're right, yeah. You yeah. know, and then even then, they wouldn't. You know, didn't they trace that back to, like, not even here? It just happened to grow here kind of a thing? Like you said, it came over on, like, a bird or something. Um, we made that long ocean journey. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, oaks, you know, if you go into our mountains, there's a lot of different varieties of oak. Um, right. But nothing really along the coast. Was. Right, right. Okay, break time once again for uh, Biz Talk Radio. We're going to come back. We've got several segments left on this This Saturday morning or maybe Saturday afternoon, depending upon where you are and how you're listening. So questions, comments there. I see people on Facebook talking back and forth to each other. That's good, too. That little Facebook Garden America community. I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnesco. Going to take a break. Back after these messages. Stay with us. Yes, indeed. We are back from the break. It was a great break for us. We trust you had a good break. John enjoys our breaks here on Garden America. So uh, what do you you guys want to talk about now as we continue? Well, Gina said that she recently saw uh, a survey to ban the selling of English ivy. English ivy, huh? Now you would think. In just in Idaho? Or are you saying I, oh, she, she, I don't know. Because, I don't know. That's like all she general. posted. But I, I'm i not a big fan of ivy. Oh, horrible stuff. <clears throat> Period. Yeah. There's... What did you have that was so invasive on your wall at your last house? That you said yeah. was oh, that was than cat's, ivy? Claw. cat's Claw. Cat's Claw. Yeah. yeah. Right? Given the choice, right? You, ivy oh. or Cat's Claw? You know, they're both bad, but Cat's Claw is, <laughs> is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can't get rid of it. it. And the worst thing is that it, goes to seed yeah and the seeds come up everywhere so you're and they've got this you know they've got a, a like a tuber tuberous root yeah that's impossible they, 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 like you can't get out you yeah. know like, like you dig it it breaks in half and then it reproduces more oh my yeah. gosh but english ivy you know also it attaches to so much and like it's a parasite right okay like it's one thing that it's like grows rampantly through an area but if it starts climbing up a tree or climbing into your you know plants or anything else like that it actually begins to kill them and um i can only imagine in areas where it actually grows well because the thing in southern california is that the heat kills it right like like meaning you know if you don't water it english ivy in southern california it'll just die off you know it 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 doesn't you know, take to our dry temperatures very well. But if you had a hot, humid area where you lived, I'm sure that stuff grows like seaweed. Midwest, where you could probably Jackie. watch it. You could probably watch it grow. You know, 
What? You're holding your tongue. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking um, there's a variety of English ivy called Baltic ivy, and mm-hmm. I wonder if that's what you're thinking You know what of, you should because... have said to him? What's the matter? Cat's claw got your tongue? <laughs> <laughs> the um because english ivy grows you know there's you probably never belong to the ivy society no i do not but there's many varieties oh, yeah. of english ivy <clears throat> and and most of them grow rampant here i mean mm-hmm. they grow wild i'm up up houses and yeah you know but i mean what i'm getting at is like for instance if you were to go buy a one gallon English ivy and plant it, it'll you'd have to take care of it to get it to grow. You know what I mean? If you were to just put it out there, it probably would not grow very well all the time. You think so? If you planted it, if you it had it under irrigation, brook, yeah. If I put it in a one gallon can, it would just take over your house. You think so? No, as long with as no it irrigation. Under, oh, that's, what what, no, no, irrigation. Okay, no, no. that's what I'm saying. No irrigation. You're saying if you don't I'm take saying. care of it, it's going to die quickly. Yeah, like you yeah. have to actively plant it. Like it can't just be something that accidentally falls in your backyard and it takes over. It would probably die out. But it, you're right. If it was irrigated and you planted it, it'll it'll swallow a house, right. like you said. Right. But the minute you stop providing irrigation to it or it can't, it won't accidentally grow. Where I would say somewhere like that it's good rain – in good heat, if you if it falls out of the back of a truck, it'll take over. You know what I mean? Like because that though the those things are so aggressive, and then they reroot everywhere. So the, the original plant, right? You it doesn't even matter what the original plant was because it's rerooted thirty yeah. times yeah. already, and it's crawling towards a river where it's just going to keep sucking water up. <laughs> there are dwarf varieties of English ivy. There are miniature varieties. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Paula wants to know what pokeweed is considered. Yeah. Yeah, uh, a few people, a few different ones, people call it, depending on where you're from, right? Yeah, but pokeweed is originally from back east, mm-hmm. and it's now throughout all the southern states. And so it is an invasive species. Is that like poke salad? I don't know well, if it's the same. Well, but no, but what is what is the variety you're talking about that's, back east like what do you what do you do you know the botanical name of what they're talking about because i because nettle people call nettle pokeweed here too oh no no no. you know what i mean right like like, that's what i'm saying like 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 it's not and and because people call nettle pokeweed because when you touch it it pokes you and i think that was a term that people heard the term pokeweed and they put it on the name of the plant nettle because they thought that that's what it was Hmm. But poke because weed, it pokes you. <laughs> yeah, but pokeweed is not pokeweed if you're in in other areas of the country. It's different. Yeah, uh, pokeweed is phytolacca uh, americana. Uh huh. And and why do they call it pokeweed back there? Does it poke you like nettle or no? No. It it just was a name they used to call it that. Does it have any spines or any pokeiness? No. What, or, what is the origin no. of the name? No. See, see, it's weird, right? Because, but. People call pokeweed nettle, or people call yes. nettle pokeweed here. Yeah. Uh, I was going to try to find a picture for you and show you the um, show you what it looks like. And then n- nettle is funny too here because there's stinging nettle and then there's other nettle. Yes. And if you have a good eye, oh yeah, I feel like I've seen this here though. It's right? pretty. It gets pretty big. I've seen this here. Yeah. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Can, can yeah. you can you get use a, put it up to your camera real quickly? Okay. We can probably get a good shot. It usually uh, translates pretty good video wise. Yeah, a lot of people would see the berry on it, and it's very common. Oh yeah, that's a good shot. Um, that's a and good those berries shot. germinate easily. But um, you know when 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 you're a trained gardener and you've dealt with nettle, stinging nettle, yeah, you can see the difference between the nettle that's going to sting you. And the nettle that doesn't, and um, but when you don't know the difference, it's you're looking at the plants, and I could just imagine if like one day you're going through your yard and you're pulling all kinds of nettle out of your yard, bare hands, no big deal, and then you grab some stinging nettle. Yeah, Ooh, it's man. not going to be a good day. No, no, not a lot of fun. Um, uh, but you mentioned Gina made a comment. I, uh, for those of you that are following along with Facebook Live and 
in the chat. I love Gina's weather report. Oh, yeah, it was, right? It was like sunny, rainy, cold, hot, A little bit of sunny. everything. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, that yeah, was so and, funny. So, okay. Uh, Veronica says, so that's what people ate in poke salad. Of course, there was a famous song, Poke Salad Annie. Yeah. Is it? Do people years eat it? Is that what yeah. is it true? Is like, like, is, is it like eat a turnip that? is it anything to do with a turnip green, John? Turnips or any Well, I looked it up here and it says poke most likely comes from the Algonquin word pokan, oh. meaning bloody. Oh. And that would make and sense. That would be that makes because a lot of, of the berries. It looks, right. they, they look bloody. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they said the juice from the berries can be used as ink. Oh, it's like a, one of those dye kind of berries. Yeah, also as a fabric dye. Yeah. Okay, break time. We have uh, two more segments coming up here for both BizTalk Radio Facebook Live. Uh, we've uh, generated a lot of conversation on Facebook Live with our topic, at least in this segment, going back and forth with the various plants that we've been uh, speaking of. So uh, keep it up there, Facebook Live, questions, comments. We're going to take a break for BizTalk Radio back after these messages. We have returned from that break. Great break. Good break. Yeah, good break. <laughs> it's almost like you weren't even ready. You, yeah, even right. though you controlled the coming back from the break, I know. What are you, you say? weren't ready for it. Yeah, break. Break for biz talk. Break for our friends on uh, Facebook Live. Uh, look at uh, Gina and Rick going back and forth, which is good about the comments hey. on Facebook because not just us, they interact with each other. You know, Rick. Rick's on there. Um you know, Rick always has the soil questions, and we had right. Jurgen this morning talking about the Agrowin products, and I think Rick would appreciate the rock test. Rick, if you if you he, missed it, go ahead, John. Because he Tiger. he always wonders about soil improvements and how to amend things, and you know, I know that he is well aware of composts and the different manures and organic fertilizers, but I don't know if Rick is aware of the rock test or if he's ever used it, but um. The way I also associate it's like humus, um, you know, like humic acid for the soil. It's or like John and Bob's soil optimizer. Mm -hmm. That's what I kind of <clears throat> put rock dust in with. It's it's you're feeding all the great stuff in the soil that you want to go and do better things with. And, you know, it's not really like a fertilizer that you're going to feed the plants. I'm with. not sure when Rick joined us, but Rick, if you did miss any of that conversation, as with anybody else, uh, this afternoon on our YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show, this show will be uploaded, and you can rewatch the show. In fact, you can fast forward, rewind to any portion. And like you mentioned, Tiger, uh, Rick, you may get some good information as it pertains to soil. Yeah, and uh, you know, and Rick, also you can order it online. Fertilizeronline.com is, I think, what he's. I think that's what he said. It? Yeah, yeah, um, to be able to order because I don't know if they would have it where Rick's at. What else uh, did you find for us, John? Well, going. I'll Back a little bit more into poke and poke salad, it uh, said poke salad's always eaten cooked. Oh. Because otherwise, all plants of the, all parts poisonous. of the plants are poisonous, mm -hmm. especially the berries. Wow. Somebody was asking if the berries can be eaten. And they look like they could, right? Because they're that dark purple. And it's usually white berries that you associate with. So, bees so cooking it is like boiling something to get rid of the the, the poisons. Yep. Yeah. Personally, I wouldn't take a chance. I wouldn't anyway. Well, like, that's such a terrible term for a food if you need to cook it before to, you eat it. Before you eat it, you shouldn't call it a salad because I think most people think of salad as yeah. you just mix it in a bowl and then you eat it. Well, first of all, I wouldn't trust myself to cook it properly <laughs> to get enough. rid of the poisons. Like enough. What is that uh, Japanese fish, John? The blowfish. The, that, that, that's prepared? It's not blowfish, is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is? It is? Yeah. That's, it's a delicacy that only so many chefs around the world know yeah. how to prepare it. If you cut it wrong, it, and, and you can die. I, I'm not doing that. <laughs> uh, I, you know, the chef could have had a bad day. Remember the name of the uh, restaurant in San Francisco that uh, Sharon wrote an article about? It was called Blowfish Sushi to Die For. I do remember the title of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, you shouldn't call it a salad. Okay, I think most it, people it, think salad, that's like a raw dish. Here's something else as we go back and trace the origins of people tasting things for the first time. So at some point with these things that are poisonous, somebody tasted it and died. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's too bad. You hear about Bill? Uh, that new plant we came across, he ate it and he died. Really? 
what if we cooked it? Well, let's try that. Well, I mean, I mean, seriously. It's and then, funny, and then, and then we're going to try it again after we cook it. I'm I'm uh, listening to this book about the history of different plants, and the chapter I'm on right now has to do with like the um, psychedelic mushrooms, right? Okay, and how they came about, and you know, it, this it's this whole thing with humans and this and animals and all this stuff, and um, it was just describing on how. A lot of them came from manures of animals. So it's funny that, you know, someone came along and saw this thing growing out of a manure yeah. and was like, oh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense to eat. thought this was a good idea. <laughs> you know? But now I wonder, I wonder if in, in some of these circumstances, like you brought up, it was desperation. People were starving. They needed to eat and had to take a chance. Yeah, it, it painted a picture more of these, like, weird – doctor healer people would go out and like we're like the first plant hunters you know meaning like meaning like if you had that mindset that you were going to be this doctor or this healer right you would go and wander nature and you would eat things and then see how you react to be able to then maybe give that to people to help i and, guess and, wow but i'm like how many of those healers died along the way <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. So Rick just responded. Okay. Did he? Did he hear well, he about? Said he, he said he um he has used rock dust. He was late oh. today. He had eye surgery this week. Woke up late. Yes, Tiger. <laughs> I am into soil science. Build the soil. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks for joining us, even though you're late. Yeah, Good luck right? on the eye surgery. <laughs> John just looks at me. Every once in a while, John just looks at me as I talk and just smirks. John came in in. in his, <laughs> John brought an interesting mood into the studio today. That is true. He's got a right? lot on his mind. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have so much on and my that's mind. That's okay. Yeah. At least he's here. He made that long drive. Yeah, I always think about that. I listened to the podcast I did all the way in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> critiquing yourself. Should have yeah. said something different. Should have done. Yeah, exactly. And like, why? Why did I have to say, you know, so many times? You know, it's oh, interesting that you say yeah, that well, because in, in radio, um, when you're on the air, I don't know if they do it so much these days, but we would have maybe once or twice a week, you'd sit down with a program director and uh -huh. he, we'd, we'd listen to the show. Right. And he would point out things like that. Were you aware that you always Fresh said, words. you know, are you aware that you always did this and that? Let's try to work on that. Use another word for that. Don't do that. And it's very interesting because just like you said, then you start picking it apart. Like I'll go home and watch about 15 minutes of this show mm -hmm. on YouTube. Uh -huh. I do the same thing. Oh, why do I do that? Oh, John does this. Tiger does it. Okay, you know. It's just a way to keep up because, first of all, you're your own worst critic, but sometimes you do things that somebody else points out to you. And you go, I do do that, don't I? It's a habit. There was in this show earlier, did you hear – John, call our guest Yurg Urine. Urine? Yeah. No, we can go back and oh, listen. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh. I didn't want to say anything at the time, but it was like. Hey, your yeah. brother's got a question. He does. My brother moved to northern Michigan. And first of all, you're, like the, you can tell he's not a gardener. Why would you move to northern Michigan? <laughs> <laughs> closer, closer to Canada where there is no warmth. Or, you know, maybe you just. Um, I, you know, I guess you could be a gardener up there because you would garden differently. You get time about to rest, three weeks out right? Of the year. You get what? You get time to rest. You, know, yeah. you can rest all winter. So all seven months of it. Yeah. Where, where, where? How far back does he trim his hydrangeas? Yeah, he wants to know, and it's different in Michigan than it is in California, and it's different with new hydrangeas, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, if they're the newer hydrangeas, um, Endless Summer and that whole Endless series, right, just never ends. But that Endless series reblooms, so you can cut those back to any height you want in the spring. But if they're regular, the older hydrangea macrophyllas, they only bloom on old wood. So if you cut back too far, you're cutting back all the flowers and you won't get any blooms. So depends on what variety they are, Dave. And I will say though that you know they they get some really beautiful blooms, big hydrangea flowers. Well, they know? also because of the acid soils yeah. get blue, blue. Yeah. Where so in California really, we're struggling to get blue. Struggling to get any re 
reasonable color. You know, they're all kind of yeah. What are mine? They're faded. They're, yes. they look they look faded. They're so vibrant back there where they have the rich soil. That's exactly yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I know Shannon. That's one of her, her favorites, hydrangeas. Right. Yeah. How are how? Oh yeah. How are <laughs> yours doing? I mean, I'm sure they're still just barely coming out of dormancy right now. But you know the um, the macrophyllas are all <clears throat> the macrophyllas are all budded mm-hmm. and uh, leafing out. But the the other type, um, Incredible, mm-hmm. I can't tell if it's dead. No, or if it's Still, just late. Yeah, still coming. Because you know those are the ones that that really don't do that well here. Right. They like colder temperatures. Mm-hmm. And it did bloom last year, and it bloomed repeatedly. So I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. Still early then. Yeah. About I do a minute have to the break. Go ahead. We have a break. In a minute. <laughs> well, I was just going to mention that I try a lot of plants outdoors because Shannon's gotten into growing plants on the windowsill. Uh-huh. So when they're mostly dead, I take them outside and see what happens and plant them. And uh, I have a piggyback plant that is doing really well outdoors. And I always wanted to plant one outdoors just to see what it would do because I know they're native up into Alaska. What's a piggyback plant? You don't know what to piggyback? No. We're going to take a break. That, really? That's the no. topic after we return from the break on the other side. The piggyback plant here on Garden America. One more segment. Uh, okay, those on uh, Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live, stay with us. Hang in there. We're almost there. I'm Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. Again, one more segment here on Garden America. All right, we are back. We're talking piggyback, the piggyback plant. What have you found, Tiger? Tol- Tolmia menzisi? The- menzisi. Menzisi. Yeah. It's a oh, high, really common house plant. Really? Does yeah. It, is it familiar by looking at it, Tiger? N- no, it's not. It well, looks like a hook, uh, hookera or huchera or however mm-hmm. you choose to say it. But I see why it's called the piggyback plant because right. it has this large leaf. Right, and then on top of it has this little baby leaf that just sits right on top of the large leaf. So I can see why it's called the piggyback. But it, I don't, I don't know if I've seen that. Like, really, it's common, huh? It used to be one of the most common house plants. Really, uh, and maybe more so back east. Doesn't require a lot of light. And right, oh, it's got a really neat flower. Oh, I've never seen it bloom. That's the main reason I wanted to plant it out. Let me Almost take like a look an at orchid. The- Really? I mean, I mean, it looks like it's very small. You know meaning... what it looks like to me? Uh, a mimulus flower. Yeah. Monkey right. flower? Yeah, monkey flower. Yeah, very neat. I mean, it looks like it's kind of small, and it like a hookah or like a, uh, what do they call them? Um, coral bell um, plant. Like, it looks like it comes up on a little spire and right. kind of hangs down like that. Um, yeah, that's cool. I'll have to look for that. Maybe, maybe we do have them, and it is more common than I... Uh, think, but I'm not familiar with well, it. Well, you know, the leaf isn't spectacular, right? It's just a common leaf. Yeah. So maybe it's not as popular as it used to be. Yeah. Well, it, I think that's kind of fun, though, the little leaflet that comes out of it. And especially, you said, when it blooms, too. Yeah. Well, we don't know the size of the bloom or anything. Yeah. But we'll see. Um, is Do you know, is that little leaf that comes out a new leaf? Yes. So it's like that's how it reproduces leaves, right? Oh, okay. It kind of it, it's funny because it kind of looks like Brian, like like that's meant to just always be there. Oh yeah, right. Like there's a plant called a um a butcher's broom. I've heard of that. Okay, mm-hmm. and it has a leaf, and then the the leaf gets a little red berry on the leaf, um, and it's just kind of like interesting, like that, like that's you know normally like the berries will come off of another part or something like that, but the butcher's broom has a leaf, then it gets a flower on the leaf, and then that turns into a red berry. Uh, that's only on the female plants. Oh, is it? Yeah. I didn't know Because they're dioecious. Oh, okay. Uh, it's only and it's on ruscus. The... It's the type Ru- of ruscus, yeah. right? Yep. Um, Dave said that the tag on his hydrangea is Ariba. 
Arriba. That yeah. must be one of the new Arriba. varieties. Arriba. <laughs> yeah, and it is. It is. It's a new uh, repeat blooming hydrangea. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's going to be a an old variety <laughs> hydrangea with the name Arriba. Yeah. So you can go ahead and uh, uh, cut those any way you want, Dave. And they'll just come yeah. back. I would just leave it uh, until after it was done blooming and then maybe cut the old blooms off. But, mm -hmm. you know, if they're too big now or if there's dead parts, just go ahead and cut them back. I was going to say, I would think there it would almost be self-pruning, right? Meaning, meaning he gets so much weather that the plant's going to kind of, you know, have dead parts. Um, yeah, I don't know if know. the new ones are hardier than the others, but yeah. we would get, you know, down in the Detroit area, we would get frost damage, freeze mm -hmm. damage on yeah. hydrangeas. Yeah, sure. So, so it's like knowing, you know, pruning roses back there, all you do is cut off the dead part. The, yeah, when you, the next season, you just go in there and you cut out all the dead parts and it's actually the perfect size. There was no pruning necessary. <laughs> Dave, um, by the way, apologized for getting a, a little off topic. <laughs> well, he must not have heard the first part of the show. Yeah. Apology Cause, accepted, Dave. Because <laughs> there, there really is yeah, no, no topic. real topic. Yeah. You know? We're happy to talk about anything. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, you haven't been listening to it long enough then. <laughs> all, the, all the different topics we've been covering. He also said that uh, we're the best, which is true. Yeah. And uh, for Brian, I think he's saying, go wings. You know, it's funny you mentioned that, Dave, because in my video game right now, my NHL hockey video game, <laughs> I am the Detroit Red Wings, Dave. Oh, my goodness. That's my team. Wow. Wow. So there you go. Brian, a, a Brian's red. playing career mode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Closest I can get to reliving my glory days. Do you ever go skating anymore? No. No? You know, it's funny. Because I played hockey, to me, just skating around in a circle is boring. Not fun. No. I want really? a hockey stick and a puck. Really? Yeah. I mean, maybe the first 10 minutes. Is, yeah. And then it's like, okay, now what? Yeah. Now what do we do? Yeah. I mean. Have you ice skated? I, I've ice skated. And mm -hmm. it's fun to me because every well, time of I. Of course. Well, because every time I do it, it's new. Yeah. Like, meaning, like, I don't go enough. Right. To right. do anything of. Just staying upright is I, good enough for I, me. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Weak ankles or your ankles wobbly. I don't, yeah. He I surfs, guess. shouldn't you? Don't you need strong angles, angles, <laughs> ankles for surfing? I I don't know. I guess I don't know. I mean, you I do mean, for skiing. Right? Yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting because just like surfing, like snow skiing, uh, all that requires a center of gravity. Yeah. So, like, you take your nose to your knees to your feet and draw draw oh, a line, and that's that's your center of gravity, and that's that's you work from that. Yeah. And I would imagine the same thing. I didn't surf as much as you did, but I, I surfed a little bit. Yeah. I could ice skate. I could ski because it's all kind of the same thing, just applied maybe a bit differently. Yeah. But I, I, it's just funny, like, because ice skating isn't something, like, you know what would be really fun to do is if you lived in an area where, like, a river froze or oh, a creek, in, and you can go 50 like, because, miles. Because, like you were saying, it's not really fun to just go in a rink and just go around and surf. I would do that. But if you had a trail sure. that you can follow. It's a way to get around. Yeah, it's that like, would be really neat. like cross-country skiing, only much faster. That, yeah, I would. that, that would, I would be do. fun to that do I would is do. a trail. Hey, we're going to skate down to this town. It's about 20 miles south. Yeah. yeah. We'll get there in maybe 45 minutes. I don't exactly. Know, however long it takes. Yeah, that would be neat. Do they do that in Michigan? Ice skate, ice skate down a creek. Or, or to get someplace from point A to point B. You know what you always did in Michigan was uh, after the first snow, you built banks, then got the hose out and filled it with water and let oh, it freeze. Little ponds yeah, on your so yard. Everybody would do that. Yeah, long That's time cool. ago, we were in Chicago back in the late '60s, and they would during the winter time they would hose down tennis courts, and it would freeze, and you could ice skate on the what? tennis court. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, on. Um, if, oh, we, hurry, John, because we have to bail out. Oh, okay. Just wondered if there was any news uh, about our upcoming live show. Um, no, nothing yet. We're working I, on it. Yeah, I need to follow up with John Clements about that. Yeah, Ryan, we are working on that. Carla, yes, we'll be here next week. Actually, next two weeks, right? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. we are next, working the day before we leave for yeah, Costa Rica. Yeah, next week we have Krista. John is not here. Right. The week after, 
we have the show right before we're going to leave for Costa Rica. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, again, as we always say, running late but sounding great. Thank you for tuning in. Those on Biz Talk Radio Facebook Live. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a safe week, and we'll do it again next week. I'm Brian Maine, John Begnasco, Tiger Palafox. This is Garden America. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Again, be safe. We'll do it again next weekend. Take care.